Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mission Gathering San Diego, the Mission Gathering Pasadena, and the Mission Gathering Movement Sunday morning virtual cast. Let's begin. Nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted. Of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit. You Tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit. Presence, Lord. 
let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and Just to give you an idea of what's happening here at Mission Gathering San Diego, we have all kinds of very interactive groups happening. Go to our website, missiongatheringsd.org. Find out where you can get plugged in, connect with a leader. We also have pastoral care that we want to offer. And we are really beginning to get more involved with the Mission Gathering movement. So we also want you to check out who we are and how we're interacting with each other as congregations at missiongathering.com. And now we're gonna move into our offering. And now we've come to the part of our gathering where we encourage those of you that are a part of the churches, uh, Mission Gathering San Diego, Mission Gathering Pasadena, that you give to your church, that you give of uh, obviously what God lays on your heart and you give from the heart. So there you will find in the links that you can give to Mission Gathering Pasadena, Mission Gathering San Diego. The links are all there. Text to give. There are many ways to give to the churches by going to the website, uh, the San Diego website, or the uh, Mission Gathering Pasadena, or the missiongathering.com leads you to all of the churches. So please, if this is your church or has become your church uh, through our virtual connection throughout the world, Please support your church, especially in this time of uh, pandemic. Uh, yeah, we need your support and we appreciate it very, very much. God bless. Just as I am, you welcome me With open arms, how can this be? My guilt is undone, my past is untethered And I leave it behind and run to my father. There is no disappointment in your eyes. There is no shame and only pride. I am loved, father. Okay. 
again you'll say, oh, I am loved, Father, I'm loved by you. Oh, I am loved, Father, I'm loved by you. Oh, I am loved, Father. We are continuing this week and finalizing our sermon series on the book of Ruth. And we're going to take a look at chapters 3 and 4. We're going to pick up where Nancy left us off last week. And we are also going to kind of pivot to, and we know how much everybody loves that word in the season of COVID, but that's what we're going to do. Yeah. We're going to kind of transition into Advent because today, I think it's today, is the first day of Advent. Mm -hmm. And we have some kind of interesting, exciting stuff happening around that. But before we get going on that, let's, let's pray for this message. God, we are grateful for the opportunity to look with new eyes, both at the book of Ruth and the Advent season. We pray that as, as we explore different scripture and different ideas, that it would be only at your leading, that you would give us the direction and the ideas that you want and that it would be a blessing to our community and to the things that you want us doing how you want us moving forward as followers of jesus so bless this time bless our efforts and um, our our commitment to you and each other and we pray that in jesus name amen amen so i wanted to start off by reading like i said we're starting we're doing we're taking a look at Ruth three and four and I just want to take a look first to get us started with Ruth 3, 1 through 6. And this says, One day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So Rich, you and I were having <laughs> a really interesting conversation about just in the, Naomi's instructions to Ruth here are super clear. Yep. And as we've looked at, these are women in a precarious social situation yeah. and without a lot of security. And I really, as I was preparing for this and looking at commentaries, they made a real point of saying that there wasn't anything self-serving going on here. So um, in a human context, <laughs> I would like to have a conversation about. Well, it's, I, I think it's, uh, you know, in the context in which the story is in mm -hmm. and the life of these women, which it's four chapters, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the context in which it's in that, you know, to say the word opportunist might be a little like people will be, okay, that's going out there. But absolutely, this is being strategic and realizing if you don't begin to move forward on something that you know you absolutely will need to move forward on for your life to be in a better place, then uh, you have no one but to blame but yourself, yes. right? No one to blame yes. yourself. So that's what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing wisdom, you know, uh, yeah. and speaking into Ruth and saying, hey, we have this window of opportunity here uh, and we need to take it. And the worst that could happen is that he, he says, go away, You're, this is not what I want or I'm, in, I'm needing. And uh, so they, Ruth went for it. And so I know that's tough. And I think a lot of times you were saying earlier in our conversation, which I love about you because you dive right in, um, that 
you know, we feel like at times the scriptures, especially theologians, uh, tend to uh, try to purify mm -hmm. the reality of the humanity mm -hmm. of people, and we shouldn't do that. And uh, and this is humanity uh, at at its at its best, I believe, not yeah. at its worst. Yes. That that uh, two women are talking, they are deciding to take initiative for themselves. I mean, that's what these four chapters really mm -hmm. about women who are open and transparent, but also who are determined. Yeah. And that's what these few verses is leadership and wisdom speaking into a younger person saying, this is what needs to happen. This is what you need to do. And that's, yeah. I love that we are talking about, first of all, wisdom, that these are people who are taking an opportunity and that there is opportunism there. Mm -hmm. And that when we look at the Bible, we see so much blatant humanity. There's, yes. So you were saying, and we were saying earlier, that religious leaders will take this opportunity to switch the narrative around yep. because it provides that opportunity to, like you said, kind of purify the text and in that control the responses of people, that people right. will be more pure. But in the Bible, we don't see that happening. We see these very real representations of, like, you're, like you were saying, this shows the best of humanity yep. from a perspective of a really dire situation. And yeah. we're going to get more into women and agency here as, as we read. But I think it's important to acknowledge that as we look at the Bible, we see these stories of people who are suffering and celebrating and having all of these experiences in between and that God doesn't expect us to um, change who we are or change our response. We're allowed to live into whatever is going on and to yep. respond from tragedy or celebration or whatever that or looks like. Or pandemics. Or pandemics. Right. You know what I mean? We have to be, we have to move forward. And we have to ask for God to give us the strength to move forward. We have to lean on each other in community. And this is another description of community, thinking things through and moving forward. And so, yeah, I, I just, we need to stop doing that as pastors. We tend to want to, I don't know, purify everything is the right word, but we just need to own the fact that we're humans. Uh, and as we head into Advent, that... Uh, Jesus being who Jesus was, uh, human, humanly mm -hmm. divine, yeah. right? That that's a part of the gospel. That's a part of the whole narrative of the scriptures uh, from old to new. So anyway, let's, let's yeah. yeah, I'm with you 100%. I love it. Okay, this is Ruth 3, 7 through 15. And it says, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning." So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized and said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. So just to give a little bit of an overview of what we have covered already in the book of Ruth, Ruth has already been working for Boaz. She's found favor with him. He's obviously been a person of compassion and um, been available to, he's giving them extra grain. And he looks favorably on Ruth, but I don't think he's, the text implies that, that Boaz is 
kind of an, an older, maybe frumpy guy. I mean, it really has yeah. that, that kind of implication. It's funny you use the word frumpy. But older, but shall frumpy. Yeah, because older does not <laughs> older does not always mean frumpy. Yeah, um, no, it does not. <laughs> but it does not. In this case, there really is the contrast yeah. between Ruth and Boaz. So, what what we know is that there is that compassion that Nancy spoke of last week, and and I don't, I mean I don't know. So I was reading on. this this morning, uh, knowing that we were going to film and and discuss these chapters together and so I'm reading where you know she goes and uncovers his feet and immediately goes in my you know what I mean like this is going to get uh human as Mm -hmm. we've been talking about yeah and theologians differ on hey that they actually uh became physical intimate that evening right there are those who say yes and there are those that say no can I tell you a little bit where I land on yes, this? Yes, I want to. T- talking about humanity, uh, what, but when I'm reading this, I don't see that. I'm not trying to purify this. I'm, right. I'm and and please send all emails concerning this to Wendy, not me. But anyway, um, <laughs> no. What I see here, I see um, her doing exactly what sh- she was encouraged to do, mm-hmm. and an older gentleman, um, basically is startled and says what's going on and then the story takes place the 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 conversation takes place but he notes to say that you are a noble person and throughout the old testament we've read and it's there over and over if they would have laid together It would have been here absolutely not in shame absolutely because that was their context that was their thing it was what they did at the time but it doesn't say that and and again if it did okay that was okay also that was a part of the culture Mm -hmm. but it does not it says a beautiful conversation takes place of honesty Mm -hmm. where he says basically and this is how i read it and please challenge um you could have anyone, Ruth, yeah. and you're here. Yes. You're here. Yeah. And and you have a lot going for you. And you're here. This is this is beautiful and wonderful, and it changed probably his life a little bit at that time. And he said, Stay here tonight, because where's she gonna go in the middle of the night? Mm-hmm. Uh, and let's make this work. Talking about opportunity, yeah. let's make this work and let's do this together. That's what I read. I I do also, yeah. and I don't see anything. I know that there's, we talked about that there's the belief that um, uncovering somebody's feet is a euphemism for having sex, and I'm with you. Yeah. In all of the Old Testament, you have these specific stories of people engaged in, in situations that are both honorable and dishonorable. Yep. And there, and it's, um, it's unflinching. The Bible is unflinching. So in my opinion, if that was what was actually happening here, no. there wouldn't be any reason to hide it. So I want to go, I want to kind of move into, you know what I'm going to do? We were going to, like I said, pivot, but I think there are so many conversations that we need to have okay. in relation to where we're going with Advent. Okay. So we are as the mission gathering movement. And this mm-hmm. means our churches where, because I know I'll leave one out. I know, uh, there's San Diego where it all started. And then there's uh, Charlotte and yes. And then Denver, which is in the Thornton area and Issaquah, Seattle and Pasadena, California. Okay. Did we say, we said Charlotte, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Charlotte. The we love one. you, Andrew. Yep. Anyway. <laughs> so I think Andrew's actually the one who found this book and it's called Honest Advent. And we're encouraging you to get this book. It's a beautiful and easy read and has this take on Advent that is really yep. unusual and human. And I was like, I'm not a, yeah. Like Can you hold some, it up again? Cause yes. yeah, cause uh, on, uh, Honest Advent, Scott Erickson. And if you could please just order it right now uh, when we're done and, and get that, it will come like in a day if you uh, go through Amazon and Throughout the book is art that we're going to be talking about because the book mm-hmm. is done by an mm-hmm. amazing artist, and so and so he pulled this narrative, this 
this study or this series from his art and, and wrote this book. So please, please order this book right now and, and, and then have it and then we'll have it for next Sunday. So. Yeah, so where it starts, like where the, the first week, which is this week, mm -hmm. touches on issues of vulnerability. Yep. Um, and that's kind of the, um, the sermon overview. When we are looking at, and let's keep in mind, this is, we've talked about this already, but this is the genealogy that leads to Jesus. Yes. So when we are looking at vulnerability in the book of Ruth, Boaz, like this guy, talk about honorable, which you didn't see a whole lot, and especially in the context of male-female relationships. Mm -hmm. There is so much going on here. But his vulnerability comes with the fact that, so there's this piece of land that we're finding out goes along with um, any, any marriage or attachment he would have to Ruth. But he would understand that he doesn't get, that's not his land if he marries Ruth. What happens is if Ruth has a male heir, mm -hmm. that land stays in uh, Naomi's line. Naomi is Ruth's mother-in-law, um, and and she was the mother of Ruth's dead husband. So this is all, it's kind of convoluted, like but stick opera, with me. Yes, it's yes. like, it really is like a soap yep. opera. Yep. So Boaz understands that he doesn't, it, it's not like he would have the desire to marry Ruth because, oh, she has this land and now I can add to my riches. He is not concerned about that at all. This is a superhuman attachment. So the other thing I want to talk about, we said that we were going to touch on the agency of women. This is Ruth and Naomi not only foreign, heading into foreign lands in a space of genuine vulnerability. These right. are people who were in danger traveling alone. There's no indication that they were doing anything except for traveling alone. So yeah. they would be at huge risk already. Women were not afforded any protections, especially mm -hmm. outside of marriage, and neither one of these women were married. But we also see that they're working, uh, that Ruth is working as a migrant, and that she would be in danger, um, she would be in danger from the land that she's in yep. as a foreigner. I mean, we have seen so much stuff, especially af over the last few years. It speaks where we're to talking where about we are migrants. Right now. Yes, yeah. It, it really does. And it speaks to the heart of God, yeah. of the heart of God, of our uh, migrants, right? Yes. Our, our brothers and sisters who, uh, the minorities of people trying and needing our assistance. And the reality is um, not to go uh, in a, maybe a, It's well, okay, do it. That we have kids locked in cages right now, still to right. this day. To this day. We have, and adults locked in cages right now because they went to a foreign land looking for a better life. When you read the Old Testament and you, and you read how Jesus led and being God in the flesh, and then you read the followers of Jesus and the early church, they were all about uh, foreigners mm -hmm. and hospitality yeah. and empowering the other. And somehow, American Christianity has uh, lost its way, yeah. and that's why we have churches like this, because mm -hmm. we are going to help, uh, we're going to be a small piece of helping the family of God, the people of God, to find the heart of God again, especially when it comes to uh, the other, mm -hmm. right, to yeah. the foreigner. And yeah. anyway, and that's very real, and so you see this again, just in this, just this four chapters, I mean, yeah. You can literally read these four chapters in 10 minutes. Me, it takes me about 30. But anyway, 10 minutes. And, and you, you read it and you see again the heart of God. The foreigners. The, uh, I'm with the least of these. And I will raise up the least of these to make the wise and the powerful look foolish. It's the continual message yeah. of Scripture that I am with the least of these. And you have Boaz unashamedly and unapologetically connecting with somebody that he probably was going to get some I mean, you know, you know, with, yeah, he would absolutely get pushback for yep. this. So the other thing is if, if you grew up in, 
any type of evangelical context or observing any type of evangelical context, you know that there is something called, and this has been like the word of the day, but purity culture. Purity culture is the thing where especially like kids are, I don't, not kids, young, young adults and teenagers are mm -hmm. really shamed into denying every aspect of healthy sexuality yep. um, and supposed to be scared of it and see it as sinful and, and um, unless you're being married off into a marriage that you may not be ready for. Anyway, one of the things that happens in that <clears throat> is that women are told that men are supposed to be the pursuers, that that's God's plan, that women are supposed to sit around and wait um, and not to have agency over anything in their lives. Like they go from, and this is, this happens now. This happens in like cool looking churches. Mm -hmm. The message still is that you go from, you know, kind of your father's jurisdiction to your husband's jurisdiction. Yep. yep. And that is not what we see here. What we see is a woman not only not waiting around, but taking the initiative to propose marriage yeah. to a man. So anytime somebody says, oh, women are supposed to wait and men are the pursuers, lead them to this. You went there. <laughs> yes, I did. This I love it. one of the things that really was able to help me transform yeah. my own faith and go, like, I don't feel like it should be this way. And then you find scripture like this. Because you grew up and you come from a conservative expression of the evangelical church. Right? I, well, as a, as a young adult, right. I come, so what I grew up in was super, super liberal, progressive feminism. But then when you find Christianity, it's like, and you feel all conflicted and yes. you're going. So you went from one extreme to the other, right? Yeah, but I always fought it. I was never like, No, oh, I can't imagine yeah, you. Right. Yeah, I know. I get that. I've known you for a while. So right. I'm just trying to help. I'm <laughs> yes, trying to help exactly, our, to our, give. Yes, but viewers, have been yeah. in that, have been, and I think we've, all of us who have been part of evangelical Christianity have that feeling of conflict. Like, am I missing it, God? And, yep. and man, preaching to the choir, especially in issues of sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no. That's, I love it. No. I'm so thankful you went there. And that's because it does lead to uh, a snapshot of, of basically chapter four, how it basically shares the timeline and uh, lineage of the birth of Jesus yeah, as yeah. we head into right. Advent, yeah. right? And yeah. how you read that list of all those people that then led to the the father of David and from there led to the family of Jesus. And so we see again, the least of these yeah. who are empowered. We see women being empowered. If, if these women would not have empowered themselves and made that journey, right? It leads to Jesus being born, but also put themselves in positions of vulnerability. Yep, like you absolutely. were saying, when Naomi said that to Ruth, the conversation, it was, you know, what's the worst he can say is no, but still it's no, and you're in a position of vulnerability and potentially losing her, like the first place she was getting established in community. She could have, she was risking all of that. And I also want to, this is like way back, but I wanted to say when you were talking about migrants and, and God's heart for the foreigner and the oppressed mm -hmm. that in this incorporation culturally the the hebrew culture and the lineage of jesus was made that much more diverse and that much stronger i love it because people did not reject god's not just desire for diversity but intentional creating us as an incredibly diverse body mm -hmm. and when we are talking about things like vulnerability we have to be willing to move into those things. Um, I want to read. I want to read from the before I did. You want to? No, no, I'm good. Okay. I love it. I want to. I want to read something from this book that touches on the vulnerability. And this is in the chapter one. Yeah, this is in. Um, no, it's not actually a chapter one. Okay, great. It's not in chapter one. <laughs> this is in chapter four, but it is vulnerability and the book jumps all over the place okay. with this stuff but it what it says here is what does it say about God 
who's willing to be vulnerable with us, who's willing to come into this world through the statistical risk of childbearing, who's willing to be attached by a placenta for nourishment and life to its own creation, to God's own creation, who's willing to wait and grow in the human womb, and who's willing to be fearfully and wonderfully made just like we are. I love that. Yep. In fact, I'm going to have, uh, we're going to have Tom put that up as you're reading it. Yeah. You're going to see it now. Uh, reading that that needs to be up there because uh, it says so much to what this four chapters uh, was about, what the series was about, and what we're heading into for uh, Advent and looking at the life of Mary and all the um, characters of the Christmas story the realness of these people, the humanity of these people, yeah. and the baby born in a manger, cave, right? Uh, however we want to go there with that, but the reality of that. And that's what Christmas is not just all about, but Christmas should be uh, the message of Christmas that it, it, we have to live into that as yeah. Christians. We have to live into these, this openness, this diversity, and the vulnerability of what we have to practice, that's the mm -hmm. takeaway. Practice that, uh, even, even with people that we need to reconcile with and business we need to take care of because we know those things, that the holidays are here. We're mm -hmm. gonna be dealing with people that mm -hmm. have hurt us mm -hmm. and owning that, mm -hmm. but also speaking truth to that and your truth. So I think with that, I think we should go into mm -hmm. communion. Favorite it communion. is my favorite. Uh, communion has played a huge um, part of my journey as a um, Christian, conservative Christian, that then became, um, I don't know, I, I, you know, with all these terms, all these terms we use, liberal and progressive and conservative, they're all real, and they speak into especially a context which we are in now. But I just want to challenge us and to just own the word Christian, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And just be like, we are Christian, that, which means Christ followers desiring to be more like Christ. And so communion really brings me to a place of raw honesty, vulnerability, which, yeah. and it just does every time, no matter where I'm at. And even in this weird pandemic time of communion that uh, you're, you're in your living room or wherever you are and, um, and you are breaking bread and partaking or whatever you have in front of you that you allow yourself to open up. You allow yourself to open up to God. It's a personal uh, response to the grace of God. That's how I've always mm -hmm. seen communion. You own your junk and you allow God to own that stuff with you and you also allow the Spirit of God to give you the strength to forgive yourself, to forgive others, and to move forward in healing. And again, that's why we do communion every yeah. week, yeah. so we can really reflect, reevaluate, and live into that. So, but I'm going to have you bless the elements, but that is um, what communion is, and that's why we do it every week, uh, because it is not only a tradition of our denomination, but it is a practice of the early church, and it should it should be a part of what we're doing and who we are so yeah so talking about religious background when I it, it has been um, it, it wasn't until I came to the disciples that I had that appreciation yeah. that you're talking about yep. it was really like okay why are we doing this yes and everything that you spoke of yeah live in that and understand that so on the night he was betrayed Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said this is my body broken for you when you gather together, when you're in fellowship, eat this and do it in remembrance of me. So let's take this, the bread. And then he took the, the cup and he poured it. Next week we're gonna be pouring because yeah. Pastor Rich said, <laughs> yeah. do we have a chalice here? It's like, yes, we do. And we're gonna start using it. Break the bread and- Pour the cup. Yes, and yeah. it's, it's gonna be wine, but let's go Yes, on. okay. <laughs> so he, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> took the, the wine and he poured it and he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. 
and when you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. Remember that you're forgiven. Remember that the atonement is already there and that you don't have to grovel. You can already move forward in my call on your life. So let's drink that together. And let's just pray for a moment. God, we are grateful for this reminder. As Rich was talking about, this is a this is a call that we are supposed to engage in frequently so we can move forward in a space of commitment and dedication and faith and trust, Lord. So as we are dealing with so many things, we pray that we would come from the perspective that you are in control, mm -hmm. that we can trust you to intervene where we cannot, to redeem where we cannot, and to bring us always to the place that you want us in help us to have the vulnerability and the commitment um, and the strength to seek you and your will above all else and know that everything else will be taken care of and we pray that in jesus name amen amen, amen. thank you for joining us this week and we um we are excited about the new series uh honest advent so please yeah. order that book uh, the book this uh, today and so it can be in your at your front door with all your other gifts that you ordered uh, this weekend being that that weekend yep. we need to mention that we are also doing this like we said not just in conjunction with the mission gathering movement but next week we are going to have a special guest speaker right here on your Facebook or YouTube feed yep. and it's and, going to be yeah it's Devin White who is the uh, lead pastor of the mission gathering Issaquah and mm -hmm. again through this series so we're going to be and have uh, the other pastors be a part of this on a weekly basis. So this is yeah, ex this cool. is exciting, and also through the season of Advent, be looking for a daily email mm -hmm. uh, of devotion yeah. as we journey toward the manger, and as we continue to work through this time, this pandemic. And but we are in this together. God is with us. God's never left. God is with us. And we will be reminded of that as we live and practice the season of Advent together. Pastor Wendy is so, so awesome. So cool to be doing ministry with I you. I love this. It yeah. is. It's very cool. Uh, until next week, God bless you. Reach out if you need anything. But just remember, always remember, you are loved. God bless you. Bye-bye. Love you guys.